It's now my pleasure to introduce you to uh, Linda Powell, who will be moderating the next session, the International Forum, Turning Recommendations into Reality. Linda's career started initially as a physiotherapist where she graduated from McGill University. Her career path led to a 25 year involvement with the development of the STARS Air Ambulance in Western Canada. Community engagement has included governance on charitable boards as she holds the director certification from the Institute of Corporate Directors. She retired from her management role at STARS with the start of her caregiver journey for a family member who faced rapidly evolving end-stage liver disease. Linda is a patient family partner in the International Donation and Transplantation Legislative and Policy Forum and is currently the chair of the Alberta Organization Group a community collaborative to advocate for organ donation in Alberta. Linda. Thank you, Michael. The one thing being up here is you can take your mask off for a little bit of time. <laughs> Laurie, Patricia, and Marie Jose, thanks for an invigorating start to the conference. I think we're all energized. For this session, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Matthew Weiss, Jen Will Smith and RJ Sigurdsson, who I believe will be joining us soon as our next speakers in an engaging discussion and presentation about the journey, pathway, and intersections between scientific evidence and consensus, community advocacy, and legislative change in making a difference to so many. That's why we're all here, in honoring the wishes of those and their families who wish to donate and those awaiting a transplant. So as a lead into the panel and our guest speaker introductions, in 2021, Transplant Quebec and the Canadian Donation Transplant Research Program co-hosted the International Donation and Transplantation Legislative and Policy Forum. And the forum assembled an extensive cadre of international experts in donation and transplantation, including patient family donor partners to provide guidance to the structure of an ideal organ and tissue donation and transplantation system. With this presentation, we hope to take you on a journey as our speakers share the process and the high level outcome of the forum over the past 18 months, the involvement of donor families and advocacy, advocacy with the opportunity for supporting legislative change. So Matt, most of us know you, <laughs> is a pediatric <laughs> intensivist working in Quebec City at the Centre Hospitalier Universitaire de Québec, an assistant clinical professor of pediatrics at the Université Laval. He has multiple provincial and national donation roles, most notably as a medical director of donation at Transplant Québec. His research interests mainly focus on the implementation of legislative and policy reform in organ donation. He's the national leader of the LEADER Research Program on the implementation of reforms in Nova Scotia and has led or collaborated in the development of several deceased donation best practice guidelines and was the scientific director for the International Forum. Jen is a full-time chartered professional accountant and project management professional with a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology. She has worked for Nova Chemicals for the last 20 years, currently serving as the chief of staff her professional career has given her so much and taken her on life adventures to the UK, Pittsburgh, and Houston. And her greatest adventure comes in the form of her family. They have two amazing boys, Owen and Declan, and their beautiful daughter, Mackenzie. It shivers every time I talk about this, Jen. In May, 2012, Mackenzie passed away from suffering catastrophic injuries at the hand of her daycare provider. She became an organ donor just shy of her second birthday. Since her death, Jen has taken every opportunity and any opportunity to brag about Mackenzie and the lasting impact she continues to leave on this world. She believes that organ donation can offer a potential source of hope to the bereaved as it did for her and want to see, wants to see every family have the opportunity to choose organ donation if it is right for them and their loved ones. And Jen was also a member of the scientific 
Committee of the International Forum. And I'll give a brief summary about RJ Sigurdsson, who will be joining us later uh, at this point, so you have the context of the panel. There's RJ. <laughs> Hi, RJ. Thanks for joining us. RJ Sigurdsson was appointed Parliamentary Secretary for EMS, Emergency Medical Services Reform, on October 24th, 2022 and was elected on April 16th, 2019 as the member of the Legislative Assembly for the Highwood constituency in Alberta. Prior to serving as a member, RJ worked with Avalanche Air Systems as a senior project general manager and shareholder. He has also been an active volunteer with organizations in the community such as Shriners International. RJ is a strong advocate for bill for organ and tissue donation and was the private member MLA sponsor for Bill 205, the Alberta Human Tissue and Donation Mandatory Referral Amendment Act, which was proclaimed in May, 2022, and anticipated to be put into force April 1st, 2023. So we hope to have time at the end of the presentation for your Q&A and invite people to submit questions during the presentation on the chat. And first of all, over to you, Matt, then followed by Jen and RJ. Thank you very much for that generous introduction, Linda. And um, I'm gonna go quickly because I know many of you have seen even these exact slides before, um, but we paid for them. So you're gonna get to see them again. Um, and, um, and I apologize, I just realized as I was sitting there that this is, um, this is an example of the outreach that we did. I didn't change the title slide. This was, uh, I'd given these at, um, a, a virtually at a conference in Dubai um, just last month. So that just shows the, the way this conference is, this, this work from the forum is being transmitted internationally. And that's something that I really wanted to, uh, to emphasize and I did it accidentally. Um, so, um, and aussi, je sais qu'il y a beaucoup de collègues à Québec, au Québec qui sont en train d'écouter, donc uh, merci et bienvenue. Um, gonna go on. So this was the, the, the forum that was mentioned uh, several times. Um, and so also in, in this also these, these slides work at the beginning, the, the kind of the opening of this conference as well, because this is a, a brief overview of what a nearly miraculous process a single donation and transplantation event is. Um, you know, and it all starts with a, a recipient, someone who's on the wait list waiting for that call. Um, where they're going to be activated to receive uh, a life-changing or life-saving transplantation. And, um, and that in intersects with a patient who has suffered a catastrophic injury or illness um, and whose family um, is looking to pursue the opportunity to donate. Um, and they have to be, though, a biologic match. And that's where an ODO, such as Transplant Quebec, or the many other ODOs um, who do this work, make sure that they are both in certainly in pediatric size match, but also immunologically matched to uh, receive the organ. That information is, is transmitted to the transplantation team um, who is almost always in a remote site from where the, the patient is hospitalized, potential donor. Um, they, the hospitals have to work out the logistics of at least two ORs where there's the recovery surgery um, from the donor and the transplantation surgery in, into one or multiple recipients. Um, and all of that is overlaid with the multiple policies and legal regulations and local hospital regulations that govern this to make sure that this uh, that all of this activity is done in a safe and clinically effective way. And all of this comes together to form one transplantation from one donor to one recipient. Um, globally, this happens about 150,000 times a year, according to the, the Global Observatory. Um, and as I, as I mentioned, each one of those events is, is life altering or saving for the person who receives that transplantation. So the purpose of the forum was to make, was to create guidance for people who aspire to link evidence and ethical concepts to legislative and policy reform of OTDT systems. Um, and the reason we have to do this, this slide um, I, I, is, is very important because it shows the, the vast diversity of performance internationally. Um, Canada, obviously, I'm, I, I don't expect you to read the names of all of those countries. That's not important. But what is important is the slide, the, the blue um, numbers. Oh, I'm going to go back. There we go. The, the blue numbers on the, the left of this slide are um, our donation performance per country. 
The, the yellow um, are transplantation. This is index per million population. The farther those bars extend to the right, um, the, far, the, the, the more there are in each country. And although the, the, the names of the countries are too small to read, what you could see if you could read it was is that the even countries that are similarly financed, similarly structured in their healthcare system have vastly different outcomes. And none of them have achieved self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency being the goal of being able to supply um, necessary organs from a pool of organ donors or through ethically regulated exchanges with neighboring countries to meet the demands for transplantation within your borders. And even high performing countries like Spain, Croatia, the US, um, they, they haven't met that goal yet. Um, and that's why unfortunately, there are still hundreds of people within Canada that die um, every year on the wait list. So people obviously look for solutions. That's what we were looking for as well. I'm not going to go through this in much detail, but the, the, the problem people often have assuming that it's going to be easy. Um, and that's the subtitle of this uh, article from the lay press is that it could be easily fixed. And um, that is a gross uh, misunderstanding of the complexity of the system. But people who do both in the lay press or in the academic press um, talk about what are some of the easy solutions. They often talk about things like this, presumed consent or deemed consent, mandated choice, expansion of donor registries. Unfortunately, when you look at the evidence for any of these in isolation, it's limited. And what you need to do is reform your system as a whole. Um, and that was the goal of the forum, is try to come up with holistic recommendations that would um, address all of these issues. We looked a lot at existing guidance. Um, once again, not a lot of time to go into the details of this, but the Declaration of Istanbul was a key document um, in this Madrid resolution from 2010 um, that really the, the, the concept of self-sufficiency was first defined in that document. So these were key guiding documents that we wanted to update and collate the information into a group of publications. Just advancing here. There we go. Um, it was a big team. Um, and, um, oh, was that? Sorry, it seemed to be missing. A, there was a, a photograph of the teams, but we had, um, you know, it, it, dozens of countries represented from multiple continents. Um, and most importantly, we had a lot of input from PFDs. Um, we had PFDs from all over the world as well. Um, and um, they really, it was key to keeping us focused on who these recommendations were most going to impact. It wasn't the administrators and academics like myself, it was the people who were waiting on the list or the families who were going through these difficult decisions around donation. So the methods that we were used, um, this is the timeline. We brought people together from all around the world. Oh, I think that, yeah, I was waiting for the slide coming up soon. Um, we used a, a, a formal um, consensus building technique that was guided by a healthcare consultancy group. Um, we each domain, we divided into different domains. They all presented their recommendations to um, the group as a whole to make sure things, there was not too much overlap and that everything had been addressed. From June to September, we met uh, virtually multiple times, each subgroup to write and deliberate around the recommendations. They were presented last October at the forum. Um, we were so hoping to get the, the manuscripts written by last December. Um, that is not the case, but I can say that they are um, six out of eight of the domain groups are accepted for publication now. I can honestly say we're talking about transferring the money for the open access fees, and they are going to be out very soon. Um, yeah, here we go. This is the I'm sorry, I got the order mixed up. You can see the diversity of expertise. Um, and the diversity of experience that people brought to the table here in this slide. These are the, the various authors, and these are the, the, the PFDs who were so critical uh, um, in making sure this happened um, and making sure that we stayed focused, as I mentioned before. Um, so, and we, we were very careful about potential conflicts of interest. There were no conflicts of interest with um, uh, for-profit entities, although multiple people had roles like myself with, uh, with ODOs. Um, I'm just gonna go through a couple select recommendations because really what we're focused on today is how to take this document and, and, and take these recommendations and turn them into actual policy, actual legislation. Um, and so the Legal Foundations Group, one of the key recommendations they had, which is not true in many most of the provinces in Canada, is that donation and transplantation needs to be governed by a single cohesive law. And that law must be integrated into the existing legal system to make sure that, that the core principles of human rights are not ignored when you are creating a donation, say, allocation system that takes age into account. 
um, just as a, as a very basic example. Um, the uh, Donation Systems Architecture Group, uh, it, it's, it's a great um, a chapter that really talks about what is an ODO. So if I were to go to a, a representative such as RJ, who you're going to be hearing from soon, and explain what is an ODO, what are the responsibilities that an ODO has to, has to cover, this re they really did a great job of talking about from A to Z um, what their role is. Um, and one of their recommendations among many um, is that the donation discussion should only be performed by trained and qualified um, personnel, be they physicians who have been trained to do so or a, um, or a, a, a coordinator um, who is assigned to that task. Um, the choice of consent model, um, following on that there are no easy answers, um, we didn't say that, if, because if you look at the evidence, there's no one consent model that has uniformly been shown to be superior over another. And what you really need to do is have a broad public discussion to talk about what is the most appropriate with the prevailing culture of your jurisdiction and make sure that your system has the infrastructure to support whatever um, uh, system you use and, and, that, and that support is going to help you maintain public trust and confidence which is always key in a donation system. Research and innovation, um, the manuscript led by, by Manuel, obviously with a big support from Melanie, um, is that PFDs need to be integrated. And also it's important to note that both the ethics and research and innovation group emphasize that evaluating the outcome of policy changes is a ethical responsibility and I think that's a, that's a that's an important point that groups like here at the CDTRP need to take that responsibility. We can't just make changes willy nilly and never measure what happened. You can't assume that just because you did something that you thought is going to help is actually going to help. And that's a responsibility that has not always been lived up to in the donation system um, in the past. So um, where to now? Um, as uh, Dave Hartel told me, we need to trademark the animated green arrow. Um, we need to finalize reports, as I mentioned, that's happening, produce summaries that with the, the help of, of Manuel and the KT team um, here at the CDTRP has been ongoing. We are engaging stakeholders. We're disseminating professional groups. The ISODP is very interested in this as well. I, I am on a, a committee around international development within the International Society of Organ Donation and Procurement. And they are looking to use these documents to help individual countries who are hoping to develop their systems. Um, hopefully, we're going to create a partnership with Uganda to, um, to really um, implement some of these changes. And um, so, yeah, that engagement is ongoing. I thank you. Um, you know, when you look online, this is where to go. Um, we, all the recommendations are there. And very shortly, the Transplantation Direct publications will be available. So thank you for attention. Sorry if I went a little over. I didn't have a timer. Second. All right. Thank you, Matt. A terrific presentation. One of the published objectives of the forum's knowledge translation strategies was to support PFD partners and patient groups who are engaged in driving change. And as we've heard this morning already many times, the value of the voice of the donor family is so key to these discussions. And Jen, you to share your thoughts um, and learnings with your extensive experience with advocacy, not only in organ donation, but also in the um, social daycare system. And of course, the value of patient and donor family involvement. Thank you. Um, I, uh, it amazes me. I've been speaking about Mackenzie for 10 years now. She's been, she's been gone for 10 years and I still get crackly voice every time. So, uh, I don't know if I'll ever get over the emotion, um, that, that comes along with, with bragging about her. Um, but it really is, it's rooted in, in pride. So, uh, it, it really is rooted in pride. So as, as, as Linda, I can't even speak now, uh, Linda mentioned I, I, I had the honor and pleasure of, uh, of working alongside Matt and, and the rest of the group on the, on the scientific committee for the uh, forum. And obviously as a PFD, you bring that lived experience. That's what you're there is to bring that lived experience to the table. And always I bring the lived experience as a donor mom, as living through that, um, you know, that three day period where we watched uh, Mackenzie's donation unfold and all of the, 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 the wonderful aspects, the really, really hard aspects and, and hope to bring it to the table. But just before the forum, I actually had a, a, an entirely different lived experience that Linda alluded to. Um, 
I quite frankly had a complete legislative advocacy fail. We, we were really, really working towards some legislative change uh, around childcare and, and the daycare uh, system, and it came up a bust. And everything that we did along the way, uh, really upon reflection, created the, 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 the context that I came into this forum with. And there was a couple of really key uh, learnings from, from that experience. And maybe just as a, as a bit of a background on that experience, Mackenzie did die at the hand of her, of her daycare provider. So she, her daycare provider was charged with second degree murder. We went through a four year um, uh, criminal investigative process, which you know culminated in her, her daycare provider being charged with, or sentenced to five and a half years in jail. Two years following that, though, we had a fatality inquiry, and that's really, you know, sort of a root cause analysis that happened in the court. We were in court for a week. My husband, Dan, and I participated uh, as active participate, participants sitting, you know, at the lawyer's table and taking our turns, asking questions of all the experts who were presenting. And Justice Hawks, who did a phenomenal job post the inquiry, took 10 months, almost a full year to deliberate, and he wrote this wonderful report that laid out 10 recommendations, similar to the output of, of the forum, to increase safety in, in childcare. It was evidence-based, it was rooted in, in, in best practices from other jurisdictions, it was taking lessons learned and trying to incorporate them into his recommendations. And I remember getting that report and reading it and thinking, this is a no-brainer. Like, this is it, This all of this work, all of this investment by not only our family, but all of the people in the system that have made this report possible. This is a no brainer, change is coming, you know, I, we couldn't have been happier with the outcome. And uh, unfortunately the, the act opened and then the act closed. And really substantively none of those recommendations that Justice Hawks put forward were put into practice. And that was really eye-opening for me of how can all of this work this, this, this evidence base, this just no brainer uh, recommendations not be put into practice. And so there was three really key uh, learnings I think I took away from that. Then I brought into uh, some of the discussions that I was able to, to participate in at the scientific uh, committee level. One is words matter, words matter. And by that, I mean, you know, how always be thinking about how can, um, you know, a phrase or, or a meeting be, Probably misinterpreted is the biggest danger by a layperson, media, you know, any individual, because there's nothing that will destroy, destroy trust quicker than a misinterpretation of intent. Um, and, and, you know, the tragedy is it, it, it's the easiest thing to clear up if you're just willing to, to talk it through and, and make sure a common understanding. The second is don't underestimate how difficult it is to change the culture. Uh, I think I, I really, I was naive, totally naive to that going into the childcare aspect. And what really resonated with me at some of the discussions was the aspirational model. What is this aspirational model? Because it takes you away from pitting one system against the other and all the reasons why this system could be better or worse than the other. And instead of arguing about which system is best, you can just remove all of that, create the, the model we can all aspire to without judgment. But it allows each jurisdiction the freedom to act within that. Each jurisdiction can then take, you know, their reality, baseline themselves against that, assess what resources they have, where they want to go, and then we're all moving towards a common North Star. So that was a, a, a second, the second learning. And the third was, in light of that, though, it has to be pragmatic. It also has to be pragmatic. The recommendations have to be pragmatic. Because the, the infrastructure, if the infrastructure isn't there to support it, if, if the realities of the system mean, you know, the, the, the recommendations can't be put into practice, then, you know, what was it, what was it all for? And in my, in my professional life, we often say, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So your strategy can be well-baked and well-meaning, but the culture will take it down every time if you don't have every person bought into it and believing it. So from the legislative perspective, I think, you know, what, we, what, what I learned was practice can eat legislation for breakfast. Um, and, and that doesn't mean anybody's gonna outright, you know, go against legislation, but really what's gonna matter is convincing every single decision point along the way, every boot on the ground that 
this is what they they want to do and what they should be doing. How do we how do we get you know working in unison? So those were, I mean, alongside the the, the, the lived uh, experience and of course taking any opportunity to to brag about Mackenzie, I really came into to the to the forum with with that that experience fresh and the raw the, the wound raw to be honest with you I mean that was a bit of a of a soul crushing experience to to go through but really helped me see the the forum perhaps in a different light um but at the end of the day I'll I'll, I'll close by saying at the end of the day it's really about honoring honoring my daughter uh, anytime I, I can I can get to to, to honor Mackenzie I, I take that but really making sure that the the wishes of uh, of patients are honored so that lives can be saved. There's nothing more complicated about it than that. And I would say I give absolutely nothing but kudos to the entire team I worked with, not only for their willingness to lean into some of those, con those conversations with me, but I was struck, absolutely struck by um, the sincerity and, and the common objective to just make a system the best that it can possibly be. So I thank you for that opportunity and thank you for the opportunity to share today. Thank you, Jen. I know that's always a difficult conversation and you are so eloquent in, in explaining what happened and your engagement and how to move change. So thank you. At this point, before we get further into the um, advocacy piece, I'd like to give some background about the Alberta Organization Group just to further flesh out the um, advocacy discussion. The Alberta Organization Group is a community collaborative formed in 2017 with a key focus, advocacy for an enhanced organ and donation system in Alberta. And it was formed due to the personal or friend experiences of the founding members, Brian Fileski, a lawyer who had a friend who had end-stage kidney disease, and Murray Wilson, who many of us know, investment banker and a recipient. The AOG has interfaced on an ongoing basis with Alberta Health, Ministry of Health, the health delivery system in Alberta, putting forward and advocating for specific recommendations for action. And through this time, the opportunity arose, it's all about intersections, arose for intersections with the International Forum, meeting Jen, growing our team, and supporting the legislative change and amendment process in Alberta with solid best practice consensus. And we continue on this road of advocacy and change. The work is never done, as Jen has said. The process is not perfect. You choose the hills to die on, but it's been so gratifying to see so many organizations and individuals coming together, collaborating and intersecting for effective and systemic changes. The AOG Collaborative is small but mighty, and there's a wide diversity of skill sets and knowledge at the table. And that is really important to ensure that we have that multiplicity and diversity of input. Medical, Lori West and Dr. Leanne Tibbles and Greg Powell, the ATI with Patricia Gongle, Jen, the Northern Alberta, Northwest Territories and Southern Alberta, Saskatchewan Kidney Foundation branches, statistical analysis, philanthropy. There's no replacement either for the voices of the donor family and those on wait lists with end stage organ failure. And I know that RJ will be referring to that as well. I often talk about three P's that are really, really important for advocacy. And Jen, you referred to them in other ways. People, passion, and persistence. Don't let it go. If it's worth to fight for, continue to fight for it. Our community engagement added strength and support to the incredible work that R.J. Sigurdsson did in bringing forward his private member's bill to amend and improve Alberta's organ and tissue donation system and legislation. Another knowledge translation initiative of the International Forum is all about linking. Influence the behavior and support evidence-based action from policymakers within governments and healthcare settings. 
So with this, over to you, RJ, online. Thank you for joining us. And we know you have a busy legislative calendar right now and really appreciate the time and the hour that you have with us. We're looking forward to hearing your perspective and experience and wanted to thank you for your very hard work. This act was passed unanimously in the Legislative Assembly in May, a testament to your hard work and the acknowledgement that this is life-saving work and nonpartisan. Thank you. Look forward to hearing your comments. And uh, I, I just want to start uh, by thanking CDTRP for allowing me the opportunity to uh, be here. Uh, I had every intention of being in person, but of course we are in session right now. Um, so I, I'm happy I was uh, able to be able to uh, be here and speak. Um, and first and foremost, Linda, uh, thank you for that acknowledgement of my Bill 205. Um, but what I would say is it's a reflection of all the hard work of, of yourself, Greg Powell, Jennifer Wolfsmith, uh, Matthew Weiss, and all of the tissue and organ donation groups here in the province. Um, really, all of those together collectively um, the work that's gone in for years and years uh, is how I was educated. And today I kind of wanted to focus on that process and maybe share a little bit of my story of how this came to be. Early on, um, I was unaware when I was elected of the process of what a private member bill is. It is a lottery system where you're drawn. And if you're drawn high enough, you have a very high likelihood of getting your bill to the floor and passed. It was only 24 hours after I was drawn where, of course, we were um, in the midst of COVID. And at that time I was working from home. So I didn't have the opportunity to be able to get out into the public, but my phone rang and a local resident, Cindy Krieger, shared a story with me of her early twenties daughter who had traveled to Nova Scotia, subsequently um, succumbed to her injuries and uh, became a tissue and organ donor, uh, saving countless lives. It was through that process that I, I identified that um, the opportunity here uh, would, would really change and impact lives in Alberta. And of course, reached out to yourself and Greg uh, because of your involvement and in organization. And, and really through that, there was an education piece and, and you guided me through that process. And I think it's important to talk about how this came to be. I mean, those advocacy groups, what happens with organization or um, Kidney Foundation, Heart and Stroke, what they had really done for me is identified the legislative barriers and the challenges that exist in the province. And I think that's important to talk about because regardless of where you are, um, of course, there's multiple different healthcare delivery systems. So of course, the approach on this is gonna be different everywhere you go. And that's where I really leaned on those advocacy groups and uh, tissue and organ donation groups to be able to identify what the barriers were. And then with that, work on a strategy on what we're going to do to move forward. And of course, um, move into a process of drafting the legislation. This was probably one of the most complicated pieces because Government, if it's a government bill, always have a lot more resources. But what I would like to communicate is the fact that don't uh, utilize private member bills in approaching those that have been uh, drawn for one, because it really can present an opportunity to elevate um, and bring uh, this conversation to your local assembly, whether it be federal or provincial. Um, it can spark and, and start the ball rolling and, and it presents a great opportunity. One of the things I did identify though as a private member was through the drafting of the legislation, it's not easy. Um, and this is where I think one of the um, comments that I would like to make is when, when uh, advocacy groups, they've done a great job for years and years of, of you know, identifying within their local jurisdictions what some of their, their hurdles or barriers are, uh, drafting of the legislation is, is sometimes tough. Um, I was leaning on um, as many resources as I could to get the best piece of legislation put together that would identify those challenges moving forward. And of course, here in Alberta, one of our greatest challenges was 
Uh, we have two ODOs, um, which was identified um, as being an issue here in the province. Of course, uh, through the conversations and education that was provided to me by these groups, also the importance of mandatory referrals. So we worked through that process. Um, with a lot of the organizations, what I would recommend is, um, and I think a learning process for me is, I, I, when I was drafting this legislation, I think I, I, going back now, a lesson I would have learned was to maybe engage some of the log, uh, lobbyists and law groups that specialize in identifying how to bring uh, legislation uh, more complete uh, and work on that ahead of time. Um, really what happened to me was the legislative process was so fast, it was really scrambled and I wish I had more resources. But I, hearkening back to what Jennifer Wolfsmith said is recognize that even when a piece of legislation hits the floor, the work is not over. Um, the support that came in behind that from the tissue and organ donation organizations from around the province to continue to send letters to all the members of the Legislative Assembly uh, really heightened the awareness of the importance of this bill and I think was a key factor to getting this bill passed. And even afterwards, the continued and ongoing work um, that organization is doing within Alberta and other advocacy groups to make sure that the legislation, when it moves into a, a process of building the regulations, I've always said that legislation enables changes. And then behind that, there's regulations built behind that legislation. So I know that organization and other um, um, you know, advocacy groups across the province have continued to interact with the minister and government to make sure that that legislation is, is going to be as impactful as possible. So when you look at it, uh, Jennifer said it correct, you just can't stop. You've got to continue working on this, even after the legislation is passed to ensure that when those regulations are drafted, that uh, it is going to represent the intent of what it was uh, put to the floor for. Um, moving forward, I think, um, you know, I, I've, I've thought in many different ways of, of what can be done better. And I think out of anything, I would just say that uh, continue to educate. I, I think I noticed at the start of this meeting when I was listening to some of the conversations that I probably should have brought a medical dictionary. Um, I, I'm a legislator. And really when it comes down to it, in order to communicate your message, um, make sure you're approaching your local MLAs, all of them. It's not always just the Minister of Health. Uh, if you continue to educate everyone across the Legislative Assembly, it'll heighten the awareness and the needs for change. And I think tissue and organ donation presents uh, such a great argument on why um, we need to put a focus on this to be able to, to provide those um, changes and understanding and making sure that those that are in government uh, have a role to play to make this a better space. Um, you know, I, I think at this time, considering, um, um, you know, how much time we have for this conversation, I, I, I will end there because I, I think um, I, I would like to leave it maybe to some Q and A, Linda, if that's appropriate, if anybody did want to ask me some questions uh, with regards to the process. Thanks so much, RJ. And I think as you've seen over the conversation over the past half an hour, it's been a journey and the intersections and opportunity have been tremendous as people collaborate together and the journey's not done. So I'd like to invite questions. Anyone have a question? Yes, we have one coming to the mic and also put a question in the chat uh, for those online. Just a quick question. Oh, go ahead. No. Thank you very much. Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, because you talked about the international sort of framework, and then we talked about an individual provincial framework. One of the things where I, I happen to have a heart from Nova Scotia, I live in Ontario, and even between Ontario and Nova Scotia, it's very different. So they have a different system. They have even different communications that they have between, say, recipient and, and donor. Uh, and so I, I guess one of the challenges we have is within Canada. Are, could you talk a little bit about some of the barriers to get some consistency across uh, Canada? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think I, I can take this. So, so it's a great question. And it is, there are some particularities in Canada. Um, although 
it, it, every country around the world has uh, it, most often they have both local, be it the, the states and the states or regional ODOs, and then that are governed by a federal network. Um, and that is the case in Canada. There is um, a process ongoing called the collaborative where the um, Health Canada became interested in the donation system. Um, and so, for example, one of the groups there is uh, interprovincial organ sharing um, that is really working on making sure that there are both on the, the front end uh, clear agreements between the provinces on uh, make on um, exchange of information exchange of organs and trying to harmonize um, there's a lot of variability around who gets listed for what reason and how and how they um, the information is exchanged and I can say there's been great work on the donation side to facilitating um, the organ offers, and we're going to have a much more streamlined software system that's being implemented nationally. Um, and there's also data sharing on the back end to make sure the quality improvement, research and initiatives. So I can say there is a lot of work in that field. Um, there is not currently a call for a federal legislation to oversee the donation and transplant system, although I certainly think that's something that could be considered um, in the in the near future. Um, so I guess there, there, it, it's 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 something that needs to be it needs continued work and there is continued work going on at, at very high levels um, currently. Thank you. Question? Uh, I'm Islam I'm a transplant nephrologist from Toronto, and I would like to comment to this whole theme uh, of, of creating and bringing a legislation and, and, a, and a consistent legislation about donation and integrating into the uh, existing uh, legal system. Uh, you mentioned uh, that this will have to be done after or along uh, a diverse and a public discussion, and I, I just wanted to emphasize the need for that and making sure that uh, voices of communities are being sought out, especially for those that uh, whose voices are not usually heard. And we need to go beyond the usual kind of advocacy groups. And, and of course, patients and families, voices are important, but also we need to hear uh, the voices of the general public. And that, that discussion and that conversation will also be a, a vehicle for knowledge mobilization and, and education and information, and eventually will we'll, uh, uh, help the success of the, the legal uh, process as well. It's, it's absolutely key to do that and do that properly and be prepared to hear the different voices and know what how to work with those differences. Thank you. RJ, do you have an additional comments that comment? You know, I, I will say that um, I really like the idea of looking at something that's more unified across. So when, when we were working on legislation, I, you know, you step into this area and you recognize that um, words really do matter. And with that, one of the challenges with the drafting I know on my end, when I was dealing with legal counsel to be able to move forward was the discussion. I mean, we had to break it down to must and shall. And I think when you look um, when you look at that and the challenges that were presented, of course, each province is unique and different and, and you can identify that, but the ability to be able to um, unify across the, you know, our country, uh, Canada and internationally, on what is um, what is the best language and what is the best um, uh, you know what is going to have the best value for moving forward to be able to build tissue and organ do donation like ideas like mandatory referral and how that is executed uh, I think those present a great potential and and with that um, you know what's left as legislators like myself when the barriers were identified but we had to overcome the barriers how far I had to look in order to be able to find language that was accepted and find language that was legally uh, accepted to be able to move forward with that initiative. So I, I think coming together as a community as, whole, as a whole, both internationally and within our own country would be greatly beneficial to legislators to, to move this conversation forward. Thank you. We've come to the end of our time. 
Um, so <laughs> I, I'm, we were, as moderators, watch the clock. <laughs> uh, so thank you to our panel for your excellent presentations. And I think this is the beginning of a discussion. Words matter. Let's continue the words and let's keep uh, looking for solutions in all of our jurisdictions and working together. So thank you. And if there's any other questions on the chat, maybe we could handle them at another time.